Thank you very much. Uh, the feeling is completely mutual, Laura, as you'll see in, in, in the talk. And the, the title of my talk is Translating Discovery from Lab to Marketplace, A Researcher's Guide to a Different Culture. Because this is the talk that I wish somebody had given to me many years ago, realizing that business is a really different culture that we're not accustomed to as researchers or academics, that uses <clears throat> different languages, language, uses many of the same words in different contexts, and also has different values. So what I'm going to try to do is give you a little bit of a guide to some of those differences to get you started. I like to focus on what is the task. What is the main thing that we're interested in? And I couldn't find a better expression of this than a quote, which was the task is not so much to see what no one has yet seen, but to think what nobody has yet thought about that, about that which everybody sees. And this was from Erwin Schrodinger, the famous physicist. So what I'm going to do is give you the same presentation, the same project in two different presentations. The first presentation will be very short. It'll be something similar to what's called an elevator pitch, which is what you tell to people who are interested in the topic and you want to learn about it or want to invest or are thinking about buying this product. And it's a very nice packaged sales pitch. Then we'll have the real story. We'll look under the hood and see what really happened along the way and give you a little bit of a taste of some of the challenges in terms of learning a new culture. So the main topic we're talking about is a, a rhythm of the heart called atrial fibrillation. And it, to understand atrial fibrillation, you have to know the difference between that and a normal rhythm. So this is an electrocardiogram of what's called normal sinus rhythm, the normal beating of the heart. The normal sinus rhythm, you have a small little blip in front of the large blip. That small little blip is the contraction of the receiving chambers of the heart, the atria. That's followed by the large blip, which is the, the pumping chambers. That's normal sinus rhythm. Atrial fibrillation is a chaotic rhythm where the receiving chambers are not contracting regularly. They're jiggling almost like jello. And what's happening is occasionally those jiggles cause the main pumping chambers to beat in a random pattern. The problem with atrial fibrillation is that although it's the most common treated arrhythmia and often intermittent, it can be asymptomatic, meaning the patient doesn't feel it at all. So the, this can be happening off and on. And you may go to your doctor's office. You may have a normal rhythm. And then you leave and you're in atrial fibrillation and you don't even know it. Now, why do we care if somebody's in atrial fibrillation and they don't feel it? Uh, we'll get to that in a moment. But the prevalence increases with age. It's almost unheard of in children, and it's very common in the elderly. The lifetime risk of atrial fibrillation is estimated to be one in four of all human beings. It increases the risk of stroke due to clots that can form in the receiving chambers of the heart. And this is the big problem. Not only does it increase the risk of stroke, but the type of strokes that it causes are particularly pernicious and, and more fatal than other strokes. If you know the person has atrial fibrillation and treat it, then you can reduce that risk almost back down to normal. So it's very important to diagnose it. So what about atrial fibrillation stroke? In the United States, there are about 795,000 strokes a year. Of those, 600,000 are the first stroke that the person has ever experienced. Of those, 105,000 are related to atrial fibrillation that was known before the patient had the stroke. Based on a number of research studies, about 75,000 of the, these strokes are due to new atrial fibrillation that was unknown prior to the stroke. or currently undiagnosed atrial fibrillation, that even after the patient's had the stroke and is being treated for it, their doctors do still do not know that they have atrial fibrillation because it was intermittent and then occurs later on. So this is just the pie chart. So it's roughly 12% of current new strokes are estimated to be occurring to, in people who have undiagnosed atrial fibrillation as the cause. So if we could diagnose those people before their stroke, we could prevent the large majority of those strokes. <clears throat> what are the challenges in screening? 
we need to find the patients with atrial fibrillation before their first stroke. We need to monitor for periods of longer than 24 hours, because that's too short a period of time to pick up uh, the, the uh, atrial fibrillation reliably. If we're doing that monitoring for long periods of time, it's very expensive because of the need for technician review of false positives. The existing algorithms are very inaccurate and frequently will say that somebody has atrial fibrillation when they don't have atrial fibrillation. We also need to identify high yield criteria for screening. So what's the proposed solution? An automated algorithm that has very high accuracy for screening that does not require technician review, where it's so accurate that you don't have to pay somebody to review when it's wrong. And a comfortable, inexpensive hardware for screening. At the time we started this project, uh, then the, the standard of care was to use a device that's about the size of a pack of cards, weighs about three to four ounces, you clip it to your belt, and then you have a bunch of wires hooked up to, to leads on the chest. Patients hate wearing that, and it was generally was just 24 or 48 hours. So you want to have something that's comfortable for somebody to wear for seven days, that they can shower in, that they don't have to be worried about. These other devices are not waterproof, and they have to avoid showering when they're taking, using them. So this is the solution. I like to say that the existing monitors are for last century, and this is a monitor for this century. So you, if you start out with a blank sheet of paper and say what would be the ideal circumstances for a monitor, you want it to be small, light, comfortable, automated, have the, tech, the technology built into it. So this monitor is a seven-day monitor, a single electrocardiographic lead. The whole device is flexible, so it is not rigid in any way. It's four by 1.24 inches in size, weighs one quarter of an ounce compared to the three to four ounces. The data is analyzed as it's being recorded on the device so that as soon as it's brought back to the doctor's office, the data doesn't have to be downloaded. The answer can be downloaded. The answer takes just a few seconds to download, and so you have instant response. <clears throat> it's quite inexpensive. It's less expensive to produce than the existing monitors, and it has full disclosure, which means that it shows all of the data, so that if a doctor, like myself, says, well, I'm not quite sure about this diagnosis, then it can show the entire electrocardiogram per review. I should mention that the reason I call it the stealth monitor <clears throat> is because in the original concept, then I was thinking about how small can I make this? And I was thinking, well, this big box, what if I made the box completely disappear? The, you still have to have something hooked up to the chest. You have to have some electrodes. So what if you make the box disappear and all you have is the electrodes? Well, that is what we have here. And so the box is a stealth box. It's completely disappeared. It's invisible. All you have is the electrodes. This device has now had its initial FDA clearance. And there's a startup company called Cardiac Insight that is now working on a further development of this device. So that is the elevator pitch. Sounds great. Sounds easy. It's a no-brainer. All you do is just invent something and go off and market it. It's, what's the problem? Well, now we get to look under the hood. We'll talk about how the idea started. What was the initial plan? What was the initial response? How did that plan get modified? What sorts of funding were critical? So the initial idea goes way back to 2004. So this was 10 years ago. And one of my colleagues, an electrophysiologist, came to me and said, gee, are there any automated algorithms for diagnosis of atrial fibrillation? And I said, I don't know. I'll look it up. So I looked up and found that there were some automated algorithms for diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. But they had a very high false positive rate. So if you were taking a little segment of electrocardiogram, and every person's electrocardiogram has lots and lots and lots of different segments, and the question, the first question I asked was, how often does it, if the, the electrocardiogram is normal, does it say this is abnormal, this is atrial fibrillation? And the best existing algorithms back in 2004 would 3 to 5 percent of the time say a normal electrocardiogram was abnormal and was atrial fibrillation. So 3 to 5 percent of the little segments. That means if we did a 24-hour recording on everybody in this room, all of you would be labeled as having atrial fibrillation. 
which means every single tracing would have to be reviewed by a technician to see, is this really atrial fibrillation or not? Not very cost effective. So I started thinking about it and thinking there, it must be possible to do something better and went back to some mathematical analysis of atrial fibrillation, saying how does it differ from normal rhythms, not in terms of just sort of that we empirically create an algorithm and take a look at it, but saying if we do a mathematical analysis of what is the structure of atrial fibrillation, how does that differ from normal rhythms? Well, it turns out that that requires Fourier analysis, which is very computationally uh, intensive. But then I said, well, what can I do to extract that signal in a very sneaky way? And I came up with an algorithm that was very accurate in terms of extracting that signal and also computationally not very intensive. So the algorithm reduced the false positive rate from 3 to 5% down to 0.04%, so almost a hundredfold improvement. And I should say that this is while maintaining the sensitivity to atrial fibrillation, and also since 2004 there have been improvements on the algorithm above and beyond this, so it's even better now than it was then. But that was pretty spectacular in terms of the improvement. So all of a sudden I thought, this makes it feasible to do automated screening. <clears throat> it was extremely low computational complexity, and I thought, this is a licensing opportunity. I don't want to start a company. I don't want to get involved in that. I want to move on and do some other research. So this is a no-brainer. I go to the companies that are doing this, and I say, hey, we can reduce your technician time. We can re make, make this lower cost for you. What's not to like about that? So the first thing you have to do be before you do that is you don't want to go blabbing about the idea, because what about if they steal your idea? And so. You have to think about intellectual property. And also you have to think that the business perception and values are very different from academic criteria. Now, this, we're going to be coming back to this over and over again in this talk. That it's a different language and different customs. And you almost have to approach this as if you're an anthropologist. That you're approaching a different culture and you're going to try to learn what their values are. Take notes about it and be non-judgmental about the things that seem so bizarre to you. And we'll run into some things that are a little bit bizarre. Now, when you go to a different culture, and you often need to have a guide. You need somebody who's been there, who can show you the way, an explorer who can show you where the dangers are, where, where you should go, who you should talk to. And sometimes you even need somebody who's willing to be a little aggressive on your behalf, fight for you, and, and be in your corner. So where do you go for that here at the university? Well, you go to the Center for Commercialization, C4C. And Laura Dorsey is somebody who has been one of those people for me, a, a guide, in terms of understanding what is the landscape. What are, who are the people I need to talk to? What are the things I need to be concerned about? What do I not need to be concerned about? How can I approach this? How can I structure this? Also, the patent manager, Jessica Myers, who's here in the audience, is a valuable member of my guide team, my partners, who helps m map a patent strategy. How do you manage the intellectual property? It's also important to have a business partner. And here, this was, this was Brad Harlow, who is a businessman who has an MBA and has had extensive year, uh, years and decades of experience in the medical device field and especially in the rhythm monitoring device field working in companies and startups in that area with intimate knowledge and, and contacts in that area. So this is Laura, who you've already met. I didn't know that she was going to be introducing me when I made this, the, the presentation. And here's Jessica. Here's Brad. So what about intellectual property? When we look at it from a researcher's point of view, then we have our ideas, and then we do something, and we have some results. We consider that private, and most of us know enough that if we have a really great idea and some really exciting results, you don't want to start blabbing about it and telling the newspapers because a lot of publications don't want pre-publication. Uh, a lot of journals don't like to publish something if it's already been published and, and, and made public other than a, a presentation. We can make presentations in public, and then we make publications. And we generally, we disclose everything we did in the publications. So that's sort of the, the intellectual model in academia. Well, the business model is a little bit different. We have ideas, and then we, when we ha have something that is potentially of commercial value, then it 
we have it as a trade secret, that we're keeping it secret. We don't tell other people what it is. And that those are private. Now, trade secret is a type of, of strategy for management of intellectual property. But it's a little bit of a risky one, because if the secret gets out, even through some illegal means, you've lost any protection from trade secret. Now, I should, by, by the way, I should mention that I'm not a lawyer. And I, a lot of what I'm saying is my opinions, and you should check with C4C in terms of interpretation of things. Um, if, I, if something is not my opinion, I will put it in, I will say who it's attributed to and who it's quoted, but everything else is my opinion. So you should talk to people who are more knowledgeable than me about intellectual property. But trade, that's my understanding of trade secret, that you can e very easily lose it. That, now, by, by the same token, sometimes trade secret is the best way to protect intellectual property maybe because it isn't patentable. So in disclosed proprietary property, intellectual property, then you have patents and copyrights. And there are certain criteria for what is patentable, what can be patentable. It has to be novel. It has to be non-obvious. It has to uh, to somebody who is, quote, well-versed in the art. And so these are sort of terms that you need to get used to and understand in terms of deciding what can be patented and, and when you should patent. And then you can put something into the public domain. But there, this is a different roadmap than what we normally do in academia. And understanding that and how that can affect your options is very important. And the people at C4C can help you uh, uh, understand that roadmap. So what are the initial steps? We filed some patents, had meetings with CEOs of various monitoring companies that were arranged by Brad Harlow, who had contacts with them. And at this stage, we'll talk a little bit about fundraising. Fortunately, the fundraising that was required was zero. Now, that doesn't mean it didn't cost any money. It did cost money. The filing patents is quite expensive, but that w expense was borne by the university through C4C. And then that is later recouped when you commercialize through licensing agreements. Also, there was expense for me to travel to meetings. But fortunately, I was going to the meetings anyway to give presentations. And so that was part of my, my research budget. So it was no additional expense. So what do you think the result was of this? Uh, what, what do you think the response was? The response was nada. <laughs> no interest at all. Not even a nibble. So why is that? I mean, what, what's, what's going on here? Now, fortunately, I've been able to get something that is rarely seen, which is the business view of the world. Here it is. You have the known world, which has known hazards, which is mountains and rivers and even a volcano over there on the right. And then you have the unknown world, which is very scary and has monsters. Now, the business view of the world is a little bit different from the re research view of the world. I mean, we'd sort of like to explore. And if it's somebody who hasn't done it before, we think, Cool, that gives me an opportunity to do it. If somebody hasn't done it before in the business world, they oh no, nobody's ever done that before. Well, I don't want to do that, that's scary. So the next step was trying to reduce the risk. And this is a very valuable step. Many of the things that as a researcher, uh, we may think of as a minor implementation detail that is has 100% chance of success. It's just the question of how you're going to do it, from a business perspective, may can be considered an insurmountable risk. And so if you can do take that step, that minor step, which is for researchers going to, oh, ho, ho, I'll just do it. It's just, it's just, I'll do that between now and my next vacation. Then if you do that, then the, the business person said, oh, thank goodness, you've retired that risk, which was really scary. So I applied for internal risk reduction funding. Of, to create an initial prototype. This was the Technology Gap Innovation Funding, called TGIF, which I think has changed to uh, commercialization, commercialization Gap Funding now. And that was through C4C. And I think this was actually the first round that they ever had it. This was about $50,000 and led to building the first prototype of a device. And this was actually the first prototype. If you look over on the side, it says AFD 0.1. Atrial fibrillation, uh, atrial fibrillation detection, 0.1, University of Washington. And I, I designed the electronics and, and, and the layout. And so this showed that it could work. This was a one-month 
one channel device recorded the electrocardiogram. So the next step, <clears throat> wanted to reduce the risk more by producing a slicker prototype with hardware improvements. So this was funded by gift funds from the Washington Research Foundation Capital, thanks to Luciana Simoncini. It was about $30,000. Here's Luciana. And here is the prototype that was funded with that. So this was roughly the same size, but now it's two channels, had better power management, better signal quality, and also had this cool logo on the front, calling it the Endurance Monitor, full disclosure, and with a cool Husky logo, University of Washington, all that. So it's, it looks a little bit more professional. So I also had done my homework in terms of how much this cost to would cost to produce in, in quantity, and also did my homework in terms of how much existing monitors uh, cost to produce in quantity. This weighed, ab weighed about uh, one ounce and was a 30-day two-channel monitor. I simultaneously applied for an NIH STTR grant, uh, which is a commercialization grant through the Ni National Institute of Health, to further validate the software and hardware changes for about $160,000. Uh, I proved that the algorithm was superior to any competitive, competing algorithm, including resistance to poor signal quality. So the algorithm was not only good when the, the signal was clean, but it was also robust, so that if you had a, a, a dirty signal, a bad signal, it deteriorated more slowly than the other algorithms. The hardware itself was superior to existing hardware in terms of better signal quality. So you had less of a problem with deteriorating signal. And this is an example showing on the top a standard type Holter recording with at rest, where the person's just at, uh, at not moving around, jogging and jumping, and then with the modified hardware doing exactly the same thing uh, at rest, jogging, and jumping, showing that there is still is artifact, but it's much less. Uh, this was actually recorded on me, so that I didn't have to go through human subjects. So the next step, 2006 to 2008, approach various companies with the hardware and the software combination for licensing. So, you know, this is a better mousetrap. It's, it's superior to existing hardware. It weighs less. It's smaller. It has a longer recording capacity. It is less, costs less to produce. What's not to like about it? The software is much more accurate than existing software, redu reducing technician costs. The hardware outperforms their existing hardware, costs less to produce. And the result, anybody want to guess? Nada. Not a nibble. In fact, some of the companies said, oh my goodness, that's kind of small. That could be a problem. <laughs> so one of the business myths is build a better mousetrap and the world will lead a path to your door. That is not true. In fact, there are about 200 patents for mousetraps, and we're still using the mousetrap that was invented in the late 1800s. The truth is, the world's most common reaction to a new idea is to beat down the idea, or perhaps worse, ignore it. This is a quote from The Myths of Creativity by David Berkus, which is a book I highly recommend. So why is this? We have this myth of innovative business in the United States, and go get them business people that are just waiting to innovate. Well, in a book called Beyond the Idea, which is a business book about how to foster innovation in companies, they have a chapter entitled Organizations are not built to execute innovation. So it's not just that I have this impression about business. Business people have this, this vision of business. And this book talks about why it is. And what they explain is that business is built on the performance engine, which is based on repeatability and predictability. And they further say that innovation is by definition non-routine and uncertain. So it's built into the DNA of business to be opposed to, uh, to innovation, to be f afraid of innovation. And you're going to have to fight an uphill battle against that. Well, in this case, the, it's also a matter of risk. And so what is the difference between our perception as researchers and academics about risk and the business perception of risk? Now, obviously, that's a very complex topic. And I'll just sort of t hit, hit the highlights. But in research, we have funding risk. Are you able to get funding for, for what you're trying to do? 
There's the experimental risk. You try the experiment and maybe it doesn't work, or maybe it doesn't turn out the way you expect it to. And then there's publication risk. Are you going to be able to get your, your, your research published? All of these are risks. On the business side, there's intellectual property risk. What, what if somebody else had the idea before you and you just didn't know it and they've already filed for a patent and they've, they've trumped you? Or what if their lawyers are, have very deep, they have very deep pockets and they will claim that they did that even though they didn't and you'll be uh, uh, mired in, in litigation for years? What about the development risk? What if you have this great idea and you hire some people and they can't execute on it? Now, I mentioned, that we'll, we'll get back to this, a lot of the things as a researcher we think of as trivial Sometimes in the business world, you have to realize that business people are not technical. So they hire somebody based on their resume and some recommendations, and maybe that person can't execute. They can't do the thing that they were hired to do. Now, from the business person's point of view, that means, oh, that was a much riskier task than I realized, as opposed to, well, that person couldn't execute. That doesn't mean it was a risky task. It just means they couldn't do it. What about the funding risk? Can you get funding? Can you convince other people to invest in this enough money to get the job done and at the right times so you don't go under before that, before you're done? What about the regulatory risk? If in the medical field, you have to get through the FDA, you have to convince the FDA that this is okay, there's a risk involved there. And then the distribution risk. How are you gonna get this out to actually sell it? What about the marketing risk? How are you gonna convince people that this is something that they want? So these are just some of the risks that are very, very different from the academic risks. And I would say, in objective terms, the risks are higher in the business world. If you apply for a grant as a researcher and don't get the grant, you apply the next funding cycle. If you are working on your business and you all of a sudden hit some of these risks and you, don't, you run out of money, the company goes bankrupt and you're done. So it's a, the, a, lo, a lot harsher climate than the, the academic climate in terms of the risk. So I'm just trying to be sympathetic to this alien culture that I'm not very familiar with. So this is kind of the, what I think the business view of risk is, that you've got risk, 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 and a little tiny nugget of reward that you have to go searching for. So in, uh, as an example of this difference, then this is an actual quote of a criticism from one of the grant applications. I did a commercialization grant on this task, uh, this, this, uh, this topic. When I had the little device that was about one ounce with a husky on it, then one of my commercialization grants said, as one of my tasks, I'm going to make this into a patch-like device that's one channel, one week, and this size. And they criticized it and said, the, you should not, this should not be funded. And one of the major reasons was that the process of miniaturization, the uh, miniaturizing the existing prototype is not adequately described. And there's no certainty that it can be developed within the proposed project, which was a one-year project. Well, the next funding cycle allowed me to reapply six months after I had sent in this one. And one of the things was that I had to reply specifically to every criticism. And my reply was, as noted in the previous proposal, the device that was proposed would be larger than the previous prototype. The issue is now moot as the device for the studies has already been electrically tested in the target size and a pre-production layout is in progress. So before I had even proposed to start the research, I'd already accomplished what they thought was impossible, potentially impossible, and so, so dangerous that they didn't want to fund it. So that's a difference in, in this assessment of risk in the academic and the business environment. So if you are going to start doing any sort of commercialization activities, I know this sounds weird, but I can see into the future. I know what somebody's gonna tell you. Almost the exact words. They're going to say, if you decide to commercialize, you're gonna hear, why don't you just insert mediocrity here? <laughs> There'll be so many people who want to downgrade your idea. They'll want to take your idea and just lower it to the lowest common denominator. They'll say, for, for me, they said, why don't you make the device bigger? Why don't you make it 
monitored for a shorter period of time. Why don't you make it so it doesn't have the, the algorithm in the device? And if I did all of those things, it would look exactly like everything that's already on the market and would doom the entire project to failure. Now, why is it that people are doing that? Uh, why would people doom a project to failure? Well, they're not intentionally doing that. This is risk reduction. What they're saying is, why don't you make this much more familiar, like what I'm accustomed to making over and over and over again in a repeatable, reliable way? And you have to resist that. You have a vision for what your idea is. And you have a vision for, for how, how possible that is. I say that the Beatles almost had it right. They said, all you need is love. What I say, all you need is passion. You need to have a passion for your idea, a vision for your idea, and have fidelity to that passion and vision. So next step, how do we go, where do we go from here? The solution is to probably start my own company. And to do that, I needed a new guide. So the next guide was Tom Clement, uh, who was an entrepreneur in residence at the C4C. And he helped me to make a pitch in various forums, uh, and introduced me to various forums, helped me formulate the pitch for those different forums, and we'll talk a little bit about how those pitches are different from an academic pitch. And that was what I had to learn, was the main difference from the business pitch from an academic presentation. Now, to give you an idea of what the climate was like when we were doing this, this was medical device investment in the United States from 2001 to 2009. Clearly not the most auspicious time to go looking for medical device investment. It was down 61% from 2008 to the first quarter of 2009, and down 76% th since 2001. So this was a, a little bit of a tough crowd to be, be pitching to. But uh, Tom suggests I go to the Technology <clears throat> Alliance Innovation Showcase. And this was a series of presentation competitions. So you'd make a pitch, <clears throat> and there'd be a bunch of people that uh, you'd make the pitch to. Or they'd have a lot of diff different groups making pitches, and they'd select some of, maybe half of those, to go to the next round. And then they'd have those people give a pitch, and then they'd select half of those to go to the next round, and so on and so forth, until they selected three to go to their annual meeting and, and present. Now, the big advantage of this was that after the first round, if you made it through the first round, they literally gave you a coach or mentor who went over your presentation and talked to you about how to do a business presentation. And I'll talk a little bit about the differences of that in, in, in a moment. But that was an extraordinarily valuable to learn how to tailor my presentation from an academic presentation to a business presentation. Now, ultimately, they, I didn't make it to the final round. I made it to the penultimate round and then was eliminated and the reason for elimination was actually quite interesting because um, I had done my homework in terms of comparable companies uh, and my estimation at, at, in our current our business model at the time was that the company would be sold for between 12 and 20 million dollars. And that was the reason we were eliminated because they said not enough money. That's, that's too low of a valuation. We're just not interested if it's, if it's that low a valuation. Whoa, I'm an academic cardiologist, and to me, 12 to 20 million is a lot of money. <laughs> but in the business world, it was kind of like, oh, that's you know, small change, not even worth our time. So that was the reason for elimination, just, just so you have an idea of the, of the different world you're, you're working in. So what are, again, just looking at the high points and very superficially, what are the differences between a research presentation and a business presentation? Generally, a research presentation is impersonal. If I'm giving a research presentation, I don't tell you about my personal life or my, my achievements or anything about me. It's not about me. It's about the data. It's about the, the research. You give some background, but you assume that everybody in the audience knows the background and you sort of give them a little framework about what, why, why is this interesting, what, what's the general topic. You focus on the methods, the data, and the results. And then the conclusion should be strictly based on the data. If you do any speculation, it's extremely cautious and you label it as speculation and, and, and that's generally frowned on. Now what about a business presentation? 
you start with selling yourself. You talk about yourself, about all your accomplishments, about how cool you are and, and how much money you've made and for other companies in the past and things like that. Then you pitch to, about the problem that's addressed and what the solution is. Then you compare with competitors, fair, fair, generally unfavorable comparisons with com uh, the competitors. Then you talk about the business strategy, how you're going to approach commercialization of this. And then my favorite part is the business forecast. How much money are you going to make over the next five years for this product that doesn't exist, that's never been sold, and doesn't have a market? Now, in the research world, that's called fabrication, yeah, or sometimes fraud. Uh, but in the business world, this is an expected part of the presentation. In fact, when I did the technology alliance, that was one of the first things the coach said. So you didn't have a business forecast. And I said, well, how can I forecast for a product that doesn't exist, that doesn't have a market? He said, well, you have to. I mean, if you don't, then people will say, this is, we can't even think about this presentation. It, how can we think about it if you don't have a forecast? I said, well, how can you think about something that's fabricated? I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense. But you have to put that in, or otherwise it, it won't make any sense. I think that one of the ways I can better understand this is that the business presentation is a story. It's a story that you're telling. It's a story about you, about how you, why they should believe that you'll be successful, why this project will be successful, and how wonderful it will be if it is successful. And it's not taken at face value. In fact, I was talking to somebody after another presentation and say, oh yeah, in the business world, they, they ignore that part. You have to have it, but they ignore the business forecast. It's, it's just sort of a, a required part, but you know, you have, it, nobody believes the numbers. So the next set of presentations I did were for a group of angel investors called Wings. And again, Tom Clement was the one who pointed me to this group. And that was also a series of sort of competitions where they winnowed it down until there were three presenters. And this time I made it the final round. Now, the funny part is that a lot of the people in these committees were the same people who'd been on the Technology Alliance committees. In fact, one of the people said that by the end, he could give the presentation as well as I could because he'd heard it so many times. So we had a series of rounds of presentation and the final round in terms of potential investors. And that was successful. The Wings uh, is angel investors. Now this is different from venture capital. Venture capital is basically a company that's intend uh, intending to invest. Whereas angel investors is individuals who want to invest. And there are other angel groups that have developed since then. For example, there's Angel MD, which is a, a recent group that's doing the same thing on, a, on a, a larger scale. Wings is more local. At the same time, I applied to the Life Science Discovery Fund, uh, which is a Washington fund for research and commercialization. It was originally funded by the tobacco settlement money. The grants are aimed at bettering health in Washington state and supporting local commercialization of Washington research. There was about 150,000 for screen, a screening study in King County, which is called SAFE for screening for asymptomatic atrial fibrillation events. That has been going very well. The screening tool has been developed, and enrollment of subjects is now underway in King County. So let's look at the funding of this project over time. We have the Technology Gap Innovation Funding early on in 2005, then the WRF Capital Gift in 2006, the NIH STTR grant in 2007, then a long gap where there was no funding at all, then the WINGS investment in 2010, and the Life Science Discovery Fund research in, in 2011. This is actually a fairly typical graph of investment and funding of an early startup task. The different types of funding have different effects on what's, what's happening. What is in yellow are grants and gifts. And this is important in the sense of, that nobody gets any ownership of the intellectual property because of this. The investments, does, they do get some ownership. And so that's called dilutive funding. And the, the other is non-dilutive funding. The other important difference is that the WRF Capital is the only one on here that's a gift. Every other one has an expectation of what's going to be done with the, the work. So that a grant. If you get a grant, then you're expected to do what you said you were going to do in the grant. 
and nothing more. You don't use it to do something else. The gift, I was free to do whatever I needed to do in the project with that, and that is extraordinarily valuable because that kept the project alive during those dead years of 2008, 2009. I wasn't obligated to do a particular thing with that money. I could do whatever was important to move the project forward, and I did, and that was very valuable. So there are different types of funding and different types of value to that funding. So what did the Rolling Stones say that might be relevant to this? You can't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes, well, you might find you get what you need. And I think that's really true for the funding. You have to try really hard to do that, and you don't get what you want, but you do often get what you need. So overall, the funding timeline for this is shown here, sort of on the cumulative axis. And since 2010, there's been an increasingly larger amount of investment money on it. This is kind of the graph that you'd like to see in a startup, where it sort of looks like it's taking off, which it kind of is. But that's, that's what's been happening. But the really critical part is to the left of the graph, those little tiny amounts that where the project could have died if it didn't have that, that funding early on. So some parting thoughts. It's not enough for people to learn how to be more creative. They also need to be persistent through the rejection they might face. That's a quote from The Myths of Creativity by David Rokas, again, which I highly recommend. Another thought, small grants and gifts early in the process are critical to the success of an idea and have a huge societal return on investment. That quote's from me today. <laughs> Thank you so much for my, to my guides who've helped me along the way. And the Beatles almost got it right again. They said, I get by with a little help from my friends. I'd say I get by with a lot of help from my friends. Thank you very much. We have time for a couple questions before we break for refreshments. And extra points if you can frame your question in a um, Beatles or Rolling Stones <laughs> Yes. Uh, so I'm curious if you can explain a little bit more about the detail of the algorithm that you use for the analysis of this, but uh, I do a lot of single processing and Fourier analysis. So. Well, that's, I, I'd be glad to tell you, it, it's not proprietary, it's, it's patented now, but, but I think that's more, more specific interest, so maybe I'll answer that after we, after we break. So the question is, how hard is it to balance because of the, these two different worlds? And I, I would say that, that there are challenges. And it, it's actually gotten less challenging over time. I think the university supports this sort of activity much more now than when I started this. And so that it's become easier. The, the biggest obstacle was the university's worry about conflict of interest. And they've changed their management in, to make it much more you still have to manage the conflict of interest, and that's very important, but it's become more uh, manageable now than it used to be. Uh, I, I would say that it, there are challenges, but it's very manageable. And, and it's just like, I, I would say it's very similar to sometimes uh, my wife wonders when I'm working on, on my laptop at home and I'm working on algorithms or, or circuit design, she asks, is this play or work? And I say, it's both. <laughs> and to me, it's very refreshing to shift gears, to be thinking in a completely different way. And whether that's shifting from medicine to research to algorithms or electronics, or to a business perspective. It's just very refreshing to be, be changing in those different, different realms. So there are challenges, no question about it, but I think it's much more manageable than it used to be. Yeah. What uh, product line, um, product, product line extensions do you see in this, uh, in this work? Uh, I think there are some tremendous uh, possibilities for extension. I mean, right now, I'm focused 
specifically on the atrial fibrillation because in that niche, I think the differentiation between this product and all other products is largest. I see this device as being able to replace essentially all existing ambulatory monitors with minor variations. Uh, there, one example is some people are concerned about getting a, an immediate answer, literally that, that right now you wear it for a week and you come back and get the answer. And some people say, well, what if somebody has a rhythm disturbance on Tuesday and you don't find out about it till Friday? Can you make this device wireless? And my answer to that is this is version five of the device. Remember the first one that was in black and white, that was version one. The, the, the white patch, that's version five. Version four was the wireless device. And I actually dropped the wireless application in order to better differentiate, get better market differentiation. But we can go back easily to the wireless device and then compete with, with, the, with the wireless devices. So that's one example. I think there are other examples as well. It, one possibility is to make it a um, non-prescription device, a consumer device, where you can monitor your heart rate and find things out about what you're doing at various times. Yeah. Uh, so the question is commercialization versus traditional research. Well, um, at, at the time, I thought it was both. I thought that this was going to be research and commercialization simultaneously, and I would get intellectual property protection and then proceed and publish it. Uh, that was one of the challenges that, that came up was at the advice of uh, counsel, they told me, don't publish this. And that was actually very hard because I was doing the research and doing the work and you know my, my department chief says, okay, what are your recent publications? And I said, well, I've got a patent application. <laughs> and in the academic world, that basically counts for nothing. <laughs> it counts as zero. That it doesn't count at all. Even when it's a granted patent, it still is, is not considered intellectual in the academic world. And so that was a challenge. And so I actually have a backlog of research. Now, now the Patent Council says it's okay to publish. And so now I have a backlog of, of, of things to publish in, in, in a research way. But I was viewing it as both. It was just a matter of getting patent protection first and then, then publishing. Yeah. Um, good question. So what is the key de-risking step? I, I think actually it, it's more complicated than that. The people who invested money are a completely different group of people than the ones who I was talking to previously. And I think if I went back to the people I was talking to originally, they would still think that this was much too risky and they wouldn't want to do anything with it. Um, I think that it's partially doing a lot of those de-risking steps, and I don't think any of them was key. I think it's just several of them are important. Um, and then speaking to a different audience, that one that is actually willing to tolerate some risk as opposed to no risk. And so I think that's, that's part of it. Now, even with those, those people, then, I've had to do several de-risking steps after they invested money to make them less worried about their investment. Like so there was somebody else over here. Yeah. So beyond the uh, C4C staff, how did you find uh, about friends and so on? Very good question. So how do I find other, other people? Uh, networking. And I was just very fortunate. For example, Brad Harlow, it turned out that my, my department chief at the time knew him socially. And so when we were talking about this, he said, oh, I know somebody who you might want to talk to. And so I did, and it was, it was really a very <coughs> valuable uh, contact. 